So we now turn our focus towards king safety. Of course, king safety is probably the most important principle, not just in the opening phase of a game, but in a game, full stop. If ever one player's king is in really, really bad shape, usually that is what will kind of dominate proceedings and each side will strategize around this point, right? Whether the black king is unsafe, then the side who is white will really try and exploit this. Or if it's the white king that is unsafe, then the player with the black pieces will launch an assault against the king as effectively as possible. However, for the purposes of our study of king safety in the opening phase of the game, we're going to break this down into two main topics. The first one is that the king in the initial position is either on the e1 square or on the e8 square. In either case, the king is on the e file. And this we can call the uncastled king. And what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the problems that the uncastled king can face. And there are two major problems that we're going to show examples of by means of games. The first problem is that being on the e file, if one side has, for example, castled either castled queen side or castled king side, then that same side can easily end up putting a rook on the e file and target the enemy king, or even if a rook is not placed on the e-file, a queen may be placed on the e-file in this way, or if it's white, you can bring a queen to e2. These are the different possibilities of an attack along the e-file for the uncastled king. The second point that we're going to talk about is this f2 pawn, or in the case of black, the f7 pawn. This is a particularly sensitive square, and as a result, many tactics arise based on this particular square. And the reason for this, it is the only pawn that is near the king, and at the same time is defended only by the king, right? So if we see, for example, the e2 pawn or the d2 pawn, these two pawns, and likewise, e7 or d7, if we see these particular squares of d7, e7, d2, e2, in the case of the e7 point, that's defended not just by the king, but also by the queen, the bishop, and the king's knight. Same applies for the d7 point. It's defended by the queen's knight, by the bishop, and by the queen. So, we have two points, right? d7 and e7 if you are black, or d2 and e2 if you are white, that are in both cases defended three times. But then we have these points right here, f2 and f7, and these are very, very important squares because of the fact that they're only defended once by the king, and at the same time, they're near the king. So, this is something that we're going to show examples of how that weakness can be exploited. And then finally, we're going to discuss the second branch is discussing castling short or castling long. So in other words, just castling in general. And we're actually going to even tie in the two points, right? Because when you are castled, whether it's short or kingside castling or long or queenside castling, in either case, you step off the e-file, and additionally, you will have no longer this problem with either f2 or f7, because either your king ends up on c1, very far away from the f2 point, or your king ends up on g1, very near to the f2 point, but keep in mind that in such a case, the rook that is currently here on h1 after castling will be on f1 and can defend the f2 point. So if that's not clear for the time being, don't worry about it. We're now going to move on to the games and we're going to show examples where either f2 or f7 was weak and also problems along the e-file. And we're also going to spend a little bit of time talking about castling, either castling short or kingside castling, or castling 
long or queenside castling and we're going to talk about what is generally preferred and why. Okay, so let's take a look at the first point that we said we would discuss and that is the weakness on either f2 or f7. Of course, both sides have the same problem on these squares that the point is defended once and only by the king and it's right next to the king. So therefore, if there is a kind of a concentration of pieces targeting that point, either f2 or f7, and the king remains in the middle of the board, there could be a lot of problems. So let's start off with a very simple example. White plays e4, black plays the move e5, knight f3, d6, and bishop to c4. And we see immediately with the bishop on c4, it's the first piece that targets that f7 point. And so now black has to be careful about this. And in fact, with his next move, only his third move of the game, he is careless and he plays the move knight e7 and immediately black is in a lot of trouble. And the reason for that is that white has developed two pieces, the bishop on c4 and the knight on f3. And of these two pieces, the bishop is crashing down on the f7 point. After black's last move, knight to e7, we see that white is able to bring one more piece into the attack of the f7 point. He is able to play the move knight to g5. And we see now that the bishop is attacking on f7 and now the knight has joined the attack. And because it's only the king that is defending, immediately there's a problem here. That is why black's last move, knight to e7, was a big mistake. Because before this move, we see that the queen on d8 is covering this entire diagonal and so is covering this particular square, the g5 square. But after knight e7, the queen is cut off from the defense of the g5 square. And after knight g5, there is too much pressure on this point. Black had to play the move d5. He takes d5. And now, after knight takes d5, black has recovered his pawn. But white is able to continue in several ways here and get a very, very good position. In fact, the cleanest way is simply to play queen f3. And we see once again, another piece joins the attack on f7. And in fact, checkmate is immediately threatened. Let's imagine, for instance, that black were to play a totally nonsense move like a5, white would capture on f7, immediately checkmating his opponent. So in this position, black's best move is probably to take this knight on g5, with the move queen takes g5, and after bishop takes d5, material is level, but again, white has two pieces crashing down on f7, black has only one defender and that is his king so black would have to maybe play a move such as queen e7 and in this case white would grab the pawn on b7 and be a pawn to the good and in fact this rook on a8 is in a lot of trouble so this is a very simple example of how black can very quickly go wrong because of problems on that f7 square Okay, now let us take a look at one more example of the weakness on either f2 or f7. In this particular case, we're going to look at the f7 weakness. So this particular example is demonstrating a trap. It's known as the legal trap or the Blackburn trap. And it is a quite a famous trap that is useful to know because it can arise in a number of ways. Here is one of the more common ways. White plays e4, e5, knight f3, knight to c6, bishop to c4. So this is the first minor piece that targets the f7 point. Black plays d6, knight to c3, and here black makes what is a not very accurate move. He plays bishop to g4 pinning the queen on d1. White now plays the move h3, 
And the reason why the move bishop to g4 is not very smart is now revealed, because black is faced with two choices. He can either take the knight on f3, or he can play the bishop back to h5. But as it turns out, neither move is very good. The reason why bishop takes f3 is not very good is that after queen takes f3, white is left with the bishop pair, as you can see highlighted there on c4 and c1. This is not really the topic that we're discussing today, so I won't elaborate on it. But as a general rule, the bishop pair is a useful thing to obtain, and so black, in this case, does not want to voluntarily give white the bishop pair. That's why many times the player with the black pieces will drop the bishop back to h5. However, this runs into this tactical motif, the tactical idea known as Legal's trap. The brilliant queen sacrifice with the move knight takes e5. Now, we notice that right now, after the move knight takes e5, there is now one more piece, the knight, that is pressuring the f7 point, this vulnerable f7 point. However, it's currently being defended by the bishop as well as by the king. The purpose of the queen sacrifice is that the queen here on d1 eyes up the bishop on h5 and invites the bishop to capture. Once this happens, the bishop is no longer covering the f7 square. White plays bishop takes f7 check. Notice that the knight is covering the d7 square and also protecting the bishop black king can only go to e7, and now knight d5 is checkmate, because the knight checks and also covers the f6 square. It is a very famous and very beautiful checkmate. If we go back, we can say that in this position here, after knight takes e5, now black could also have captured the knight on e5. However, after Queen takes bishop, knight takes bishop. The knight is on a dangerous square. It is unprotected, and white actually has the move queen b5 check, eyeing up both the knight and the king and recovering the piece. On the next move, white takes the knight. He will actually end up a central pawn to the good, this pawn that he captured on e5 in the first place. So that is Legal's trap. Many people remember it because of the fact that you sacrifice your queen here. But the reason why the tactic works is because of this vulnerable f7 point that after knight takes e5 is attacked a second time and after bishop takes d1, the defender of that f7 point is no longer defending, having been lured away from the h5 square. That is it for two basic but very common and very beneficial examples of the attack on the f7 square for a king that has not castled yet. Let us now take a look at one more example, this time on the f2 square, and a little bit more complicated. And this time we are looking at things from the black perspective. Now, in this particular game, an old game from 1922, white played the move d4, black played d5, c4, e6, knight c3, knight to f6, bishop g5, bishop e7, e3, and black castled. So we see here that black has castled very quickly, whereas white's king remains in the middle of the board. And so it is white who may have to be careful in this case with the f2 point. Notice that for black, the f7 point is actually perfectly safe because the rook, having castled short, the rook is covering that f7 point as well as the king. White continued knight f3, knight d7, rook c1, c6, queen c2, a6, c5, 
e5, d takes e5, knight to g4, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7. Notice that now, after this whole series of moves, the black knight is on g4, and from this point, it is hitting that f2 point. White continued with knight a4, rook e8, bishop to d3, hitting this point here on h7, black played h6, knight d4, knight d takes e5, and now white made a mistake, he played knight to b6. Notice that this point on f2 is attacked once, but actually it is defended twice by the king and by the queen. However, what white didn't realize is that in fact it was only truly defended once, and that is by the king. Because after black's great next move, knight takes f2, if white were to capture with the queen, then after knight takes d3, check, white is losing his queen. So if white cannot capture with the queen, then he should capture with the king. But unfortunately for white, after knight g4 check, the king has many squares that he can run to. But no matter where he goes, black has a winning line in every case. Let's see, for example, just one of those lines. If the white king goes to g3, black will continue to chase the king with queen e5 check. The king goes to, say, h4. And now the king has been completely exposed and black can weave a mating net around the white king. Queen f6 check. The king goes back to g3. Rook takes e3 with check again. Knight goes to f3. Queen e5 check. Notice that the queen cannot be captured because of the pin against the knight on f3. King goes to h4. g5 check. Even the g7 pawn joins the attack. The king goes to h5. And now a lovely move by black here. King to g7. What is the purpose behind this move? In fact, it is to defend the pawn on h6 and to prepare the nasty idea, knight f6 with checkmate, because now the white king cannot capture on h6. Knight takes e5. There's nothing white can do. Knight f6, checkmate. So this is an example of what can, you know, truly go wrong on both the f2 and the f7 points. And we had also said that besides the f2 and f7 points, there is the worry of being attacked along the e-file. And notice how in this particular game, after the initial sacrifice on f2, king takes f2, knight g4 check, there is two heavy pieces, the queen and the rook, working along the e-file. And this is the final nail in the coffin for white. So this concludes our look at f2 and f7 as one of the main reasons why you want to bring your king to safety fast by castling, not leave your king in the middle of the board. So this concludes our look at the weak points of f2 and f7. And we will now turn our focus towards the influence of the e-file when the kings are still on e1 and e8 when they are on the e-file. We already have seen this, that in this game, after the initial sacrifice, knight g4 check, king g3, the queen and the rook were placed on the e-file, and after queen e5 check, king h4, queen f6 check, we see that the queen used the e-file to then maneuver onto f6, and after king g3, the rook on e8, now uses the e-file, rook takes e3 with check to join the attack. So let's now take a look at a game where control of the e-file played a big role. In the previous example, we already 
uh, touched upon the problems that can arise on the e file, right? So this is another reason why king safety is very important and how in general you should just castle, whether it be short or long, to get the king out of harm's way as soon as possible. We've seen the dangers here on f2 and f7, and now this game we're going to focus on the dangers along the e file. This is a very beautiful and very famous game known as the Evergreen game played by Adolf Anderson with the white pieces in 1852. White played e4, black responded e5, knight f3, knight to c6, bishop to c4, bishop c5, and now the Evans gambit b4, bishop takes b4, c3, bishop a5, white has given up a pawn, but now after d4 we see strong central control. And also we see that after e takes d4, white actually gives up a second pawn in exchange for speedy development, castle. Black plays d3, deciding not to take this pawn, because if he takes another pawn, more lines of attack will be open. And we notice that black's king is here in the starting square, whereas white has already brought his king to safety. White plays queen to b3, and black played queen f6. e5, queen g6, rook e1, knight g to e7, bishop to a3, b5, queen takes b5, rook b8, queen a4, bishop to b6, knight bd2, bishop to b7, and now knight e4. Now we notice that once we arrive at this position, the black king still in the middle of the board along the e-file, and the white rook on the e1 square x-raying all the way to e8, where the black king is positioned. At the moment, there is a knight on e4 and a pawn on e5, as well as a black knight on e7 that is standing in the way. But we'll see that there is still a lot of danger. Black continued with the move queen f5, and now white captured on d3. Now the threat is in fact to give a discover check using the fact that the queen on f5 is being x-rayed by the bishop on d3. Black moved away with the queen, but here white uses the e-file to his advantage. Adolf Anderson plays the move knight f6 check. Black is forced to capture the knight, and now e takes f6, and we see the massive attack that has built up here along the e-file, and how uncomfortable the black king is feeling. Black played rook to g8 to, in fact, generate an attack against the white king. White brought his final piece into play, and now black captured this knight on f3. It is not a queen sacrifice, because pawn takes queen is not possible, since the pawn on g2 is pinned, and it appears as though black will win here, because of such a very, very strong attack against the white king. Notice that, for instance, the black bishops are crashing down on the white king as well. But in fact, it is white's attack that prevails. White played rook takes e7, check. A beautiful move. After knight takes e7, white now played one of the most memorable moves in the history of the game. Queen takes d7, check. Incredible move. And after king takes queen, which is forced because otherwise if king f8, simply capturing here with either the bishop or the queen is checkmate. King takes d7, and now bishop f5 check. This is a double check, and therefore black cannot capture either the rook or the bishop with his queen. Now black went back to e8. The only other choice was king to c6, but after this move, bishop to d7 
would have been checkmate. So after bishop f5 check, black went back to e8, bishop d7 check, and now it does not matter where the black king goes, the next move will be bishop takes e7. As was played, the king went to f8, bishop takes e7, checkmate. Now, this game may not have been absolutely perfect. If you run it by today's modern computers, you will find many errors on both sides. Let's remember that this game was played over 150 years ago when chess had not quite evolved as much. But still, it goes to show the kind of problems that can await white or black if one side completes their development, finds the king safely castled, and on the other hand, the other side leaves his king in the middle of the board. There can be a lot of danger along the e-file. So we have now spoken about the problems of the f2 point, the f7 point, and problems along the e-file. And hopefully by now you are quite convinced that in general we should be castling sooner rather than later. So we turn our attention now to castling and let's just make a couple of points about this. So here we are, and you're probably thinking that you really, really wish you were not white in this position. And I don't blame you, but there is a reason why we've set up the pieces in this way, or rather why we've removed the pieces on b1, c1, f1, and g1, that's the bishop and the knight, and also the queen on d1. And that is because now we're talking about castling. So when you're considering to castle, you can castle in one of two directions. Most of the time, maybe around 85 or 90% of the time, white will castle short or castle kingside. Sometimes, however, white will castle long or queenside. In each case, the king moves over two squares, but there is a big difference between the two different kinds of castling. So let's show this difference. If white castles short or kingside, he will now have three pawns in front of his king. They are all defended by his king. Additionally, we remember that in the initial position, the f2 pawn, and in fact the f7 pawn, same for black, is a very, very vulnerable point along which you may get attacked. However, after castling short, we see that the rook ends up on f1, and from this square it is defending f2. So therefore there is no longer this problem, it's no longer vulnerable. However, let us take a look at what happens if white castles queenside. Now we see that the pawns in front of the king are in fact b2, c2, and d2. But what about this guy here on a2? Well, the pawn is not properly defended. So white will have to spend an extra move covering that square in the future. So this is one of the reasons why queenside castling should not be preferred to kingside castling. Because when you castle kingside, you defend everything. You defend all the pawns near to your king. Everything is very well defended and compact. So that is reason number one why we are generally castling kingside. The pawns in front of us are more compact. The second reason is that it is simply faster. Notice here we have cleared our lines, but we've left the pieces for black, right? So we can see that if black wishes to castle queenside, it's going to take a while. First of all, let's say a move such as e3 by white, and now black plays d5, castle, let's imagine, bishop f5, one minor piece has been taken out, rook e1, second minor piece, rook f1, and now still the heavy piece remains, queen d7. And only now eventually black can finally complete queenside castling. But notice that this pawn is not defended by the king. So the king will still need to move in order to defend its pawn cover. However, instead we can look at castling short. So let's imagine after e3, Black had instead chosen e6, preparing to develop his bishop. After castle, first he brings out the knight, 
rook e1, bishop e7, rook f1, and immediately he has castled on move 4. So here we see how quick it was for black to castle, simply the knight and the bishop had to be withdrawn. And we can see that the pawns are all very safely covered by the black king. So that is it really. There are two main reasons why you want to be castling kingside in general. It is the fact that it is speedier. There are only two minor pieces to remove. Let's go back to the starting position here and we see that there are only the f1 bishop and the g1 knight to be removed. Here there is also a knight and bishop but the queen furthermore stands in the way. And the final point is that after you castle queenside, this pawn on a2 will not be defended. And this, however, does not happen when you castle kingside. So it is speedier and it is more reliable because everything is more compact and safer. Actually, I wish to just show you one more quick point and that we will illustrate with a game. And this is that if you castle queenside, Notice one big difference between castle and kingside, and that is that after queenside castle, notice the position of the rooks. They can actually be forked if a knight were to land on f2. And on the other hand, after kingside castling, the rooks are too far away to be forked. So this little detail is also kind of a, a bonus reason why you should not be castling queenside. And it is this detail that we'll use a game just to conclude this section on opening principles to highlight this problem. So here we have this game that will show us one of the additional little problems that we can face when castling queenside. e4, e5, knight c3, knight f6, knight f3, Bishop to b4, d4, e takes d4, knight takes d4, castle. Now we see how quick black was to castle kingside. But white, instead of following suit with a move such as bishop to e2, followed by castling kingside, instead of doing so, he plays bishop to g5, developing his queenside bishop instead, h6, and he now drops the bishop back to f4, not a very smart move, d5, breaking in the center, which is a very good idea, now threatening to capture on e4, pawn takes d5, bishop takes c3 check, b takes c3, queen takes d5, now queen went to d3, finally removing the last piece in the way of castling queenside, but it is not a very smart idea to do so because, first of all, white's pawn structure is completely ruined, and secondly, after black's move knight to g4, hitting the f2 point, white castled, and we see the rook on d1, the rook on h1, and we see that here black played knight takes f2, forking the d1 rook, the h1 rook, and for good measure, the queen as well. This game, of course, not a very high level game, a lot of mistakes made by white, but the important point is to notice that when you do castle queenside, both rooks are going to be lined up on h1 and d1, and they can be easily forked by usually the kingside knight that starts on g8, jumps to f6, and from there, may go sometimes to g4 and other times to e4 and finally get to the f2 square. So that was a quick game to end this particular discussion on king safety. So I hope you got a lot out of this and you know that at the very, very starting point, be very careful with the f2 point, the f7 point, and that in general you should castle kingside because your pawns are gonna be safer it's going to be faster, and in case those weren't good enough reasons, then you also know that you avoid the possibility of 
falling into a very unpleasant fork on F2. Okay, that's it for me, and I will see you in another section.